<laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, everybody, again, thank you so much for being here with Code Day Labs and joining this webinar, which is Mistakes I Made in Tech, so you don't have to. Um, I'm here with Monica. Um, she is a virtual reality software developer and artist from Wisconsin. She graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison with a degree in computer science and a minor in graphic design. So you guys are in perfect good hands. Um, <laughs> I'm going to let... Monica, start her presentation. Um, thank you so much, and I will pop out, but I will be in the background. So take it away, Monica, and thank you for being with us today. Sounds good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super, super excited. Yeah, I will get this presentation uploaded or on the screen. Let's see how to do this again. You should have screen sharing options, but let me know if it's not working. Oh, perfect, yes. it's working. Excellent. Uh, if I take some awkward pauses, it might be because I need to move around my uh, little box, but like adding box. But again, hello everyone. My name is Monica Seisel, as it was so kindly introduced. Uh, again, I'm a virtual reality developer and an artist from Wisconsin. Currently, I'm living in Rhode Island. I work remotely. Rhode Island is a very small state, but I would recommend checking it out. It's pretty cool. Uh, I graduated from the University of Wisconsin back in 2019, so I'm a pretty recent graduate, not, not, too, not too far out of school. Today, I'm here to talk to you all about the mistakes I made in tech. So you don't have to share the same fate as me. I got my degree in computer science and spent most of my college years preparing for software engineering roles. So most of the mistakes I talk about today will be through that lens. I actually entered college having no idea what computer science was as I originally came in as a marketing business major. Uh, we, and we just didn't have any computer science classes offered at my high school. So everything was new to me and uh, therefore, I've made a lot of mistakes throughout my education. And so here I present mistakes I made in tech so you don't have to. Oh, I know. Mistake. Um, now, before we begin, I'd like to pr uh, preface this by sharing a quote from the famous painter Bob Ross. He states, we don't make mistakes, we just have happy accidents. This is an important reminder. Making a mistake does not mean that you've failed. The beauty of mistakes is that it's an opportunity to learn and to grow. I've learned a lot through my experiences and I've spent a lot of time reflecting on them and writing them for this presentation. There was so much to say, so I had to narrow it down, but I hope you find it helpful, find something to take out of it. And with that said, I'm excited to share my experiences with you all here today to learn from my mistakes and the ways you can grow. Let's get started. Mistake number one, failing calc two. So at the start of my sophomore year, I signed up for my first computer science class, Introduction to Programming, alongside my other business classes and calc two class. I was super nervous to take this programming class I knew I was coming in behind as a sophomore and really wanted to do well. So for the rest of, rest of the semester, I put in all my academic time and energy into this pro programming class. Prioritizing the homework, meeting with peers to work on assignments, to study for exams, etc. However, this led me to neglect my other classes. And on top of that, I had really bad study habits. I would wait until the day assignments were due to start them. I didn't ask TAs or mentors for help, and I would miss homework due dates, therefore losing tons of points on my assignments. And sometimes I just didn't do the assignments or I would just do the bare minimum. It was, I was a mess. All these ha bad habits especially applied for my Calc 2 class. These habits hadn't affected me too much in high school, but come the day of my Calc 2 midterm, oh, I completely bombed the test. I'd gone enough. <laughs> I, at this point, I was 
so distraught. I was sitting outside the math building. I was, I'd gotten my test result back. I was like, no, like I, I, I realized I was going to have to retake Calc 2, which meant I was going to be even further ac behind academically compared to my peers. This, this was very hard to handle, but it was the reality. I realized I messed up. But that's why, again, why I'm here to share my mistakes with y'all. I don't want you guys to have to suffer the same fate as me. So if you struggle with organization and time management like me, here are, the some, here are some tips that you can use to transform your habits, pass your classes, and get everything off your to-do list done. So the first solution for no, the number one mistake, transform your habits. How do you do this? Well. There are many ways to go about it, but I'd like to first start talking about time management, one of the ways that I struggle the most. First off, when it comes to time management, especially with your classes, use syllabus week to get ahead. Write down all the assignments, the tests, the finals, the deadlines in your calendar, so that way you can stay on top of it. I use a journal called a bullet journal, which I've got a GIF of here. Um, I've been using this for about two years. I'm not going to go into a super amount of detail, but if you're interested in learning more about it, there's tons of great resources online. Next, start the homework as soon as it's assigned, especially for coding assignments. I lost so many grade points, sleepless nights, and if I had just started not on the last minute to do my homework, I would save so much stress for myself. Next, estimate more time than you think you'll need than half or even double that time. We tend to underestimate the amount of work we think we actually, the amount of time it'll actually take us to do the work that we need to do. And this is called the planning fallacy. Um, if you'd like to learn more about just the psychology of our brains and reasons why we do stuff like this, I would recommend reading the book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Amos uh, Tversky and Daniel Kahneman might have butchered those names, but it's very interesting. Next, no one can do it all. Prioritize and try building a habit of saying no to the things that will take up your time, that'll take up your energy, so you have more time to focus on what matters to you and to your life. You can read more about this line of thinking, which is called essentializing, uh, essentialism, prioritization, in the book called, uh, called Essentialism by Greg McKeon. All these books that I mentioned here today, I've got listed at the end of the presentation. This presentation is gonna be recorded, so you'll have access to that later if you'd like to ever come back to any of these books I've mentioned. I read all these books that I've men I'm mentioning here, so I can advocate for them personally. And I have no stake in if you read it or not. They're just things that I find found really helpful. Next, organization. Organize your digital files, please. <laughs> um, take the time to organize your bookmarks and your folders so you don't submit the wrong file and get a zero. I have friends who accidentally submitted the project report template instead of their assignment. And it was always very painful to hear that they got a zero because of that reason. And along with that thinking, if you na uh, name your files very descriptively and appropriately, not names like that I have listed like on paper here, like as difficult.pdf, because you'll, if you're under a time crunch, you'll have such a hard time finding that document and you'll be like, where do I put it? Uh, it'll, it'll be way easier if you, if you keep your digital space as organized as you can, the physical space, right? It's just, it's a clear head, clear mind, easier to find things. Next, get, help, and don't be afraid to ask for support. Now, here's a really big tip, especially when it comes to getting ahead and getting your homework done faster in particular. If you go to your TA or uh, professor office hours, they often work out the homework problems there in class with you. So it's a win-win because you'll get better grades faster and get a chance to clear up any confusion about, how, about what you've been learning in class. Now, there's also friends and family members that you can 
talk to to be your accountability buddies if you struggle to get things done sometimes like i do it helps to have somebody who you're you can tell make a promise and a commitment to be like hey i'm gonna get this done by today please check out check on me to make sure i did you could even like incentivize it with a bribe like oh if i don't finish this i'm gonna give you five dollars so i do that well i don't do that money one exactly but me and my aunt will text each other to make sure that we're both staying on top of our work and it's really helped me out now talking about all these habits they're great ideas but it's you might be thinking okay well how do i build these goals that i want how do i actually start to get the habits that i want to start seeing well i really recommend reading atomic habits it is a really great in-depth book that talks about how to manage distractions, why it's hard to break our habits, how to build new ones, time management, organization, building a supportive community when things get tough. It goes way beyond what I've even talked about here. Um, again, this will be at the end of the presentation, Common Habits by James Clear. Highly, highly recommend this book, even over the other books that I mentioned. All right, moving on to the second mistake. You have to be an expert to help others. Not true. <laughs> so story in regards to why I thought this way. So after taking my first computer science course, I hadn't done as well as I wanted, despite spending all my time on it. I had been really gunning for an A, but I, at, by the end of the semester, I was left with a B. And that record continued along for a lot of my other computer science classes as well. My grades for Spanish and my art classes were pretty good, pretty high, but my math and engineering course grades would continue to be flatline average. So I really felt like I didn't have enough expertise or authority to help others when it came to tech. Um, and although I was interested and wanted to become a TA, I didn't even think of it as a realistic possibility because I thought, who would wanna learn from someone who didn't get an A in the class? and who is still new to the major. It actually wasn't until my senior year of college when I was, while I was talking to another computer science student that he told me about being a TA and why he liked it so much. He was doing really well in his computer science classes and seemed to be really smart, very talented in it. I assumed, oh, his, um, oh, you must have been doing this forever, like maybe since middle school and coding. And he tells me that, in fact, he hadn't been. He also got into computer science in college and that, in fact, he had also gotten a B in his first introduction to programming class. <laughs> I was so shocked. I, I asked him, what do you mean? I thought you had, how can you apply for this tutoring position? I thought you had to have an A. And he said, having an A isn't a requirement to teach others. With practice, you get better through teaching others and through helping others. So it was through teaching that he learned about his gaps in knowledge because he would have to find new ways to explain things. He would also have to go over the fundamentals more often than a lot of the other students in my degree. And so he ended up having just a stronger foundational knowledge in general that would help him. This made him get, a, get made him get assignments done faster. He was able to collaborate with peers e easily, and he knew which questions to ask in class. It was something that I learned, you don't really have to be an expert to help others. When you share your work and explain it to others, it forces you to fledge out what you're explaining. It forces you to really get to know what you're teaching. So that's the solution here to, num to mistake number one is solution number two, or sorry, mistake number two is solution number two. Don't wait to be an expert. Share what you're learning now. Document it, learn, teach it. We'll go into all the steps as to how you can go about this. So before we start actually talking about teaching, uh, I think it's important to start talking about, excuse me, talking about learning. So when it comes to learning, a great way to do that is through projects. I made the mistake of assuming that to 
learn best for programming, I needed to just focus on certain skills that if I were to master certain skills, I would be all set for my future job. But I really found um, this, a t uh, this to be a tough way to go about learning because it's a lot easier to get excited about building and finishing something than just focusing on a skill where you never really know where, it's, where there's an end to it. You could always continue to master it. So I would encourage to focus on building projects over building skills. You'll also have more to say for it. If you focus on building a project, you'll, you'll for sure build the skills at the same time. You'll often get in more a better idea of what your desired future role will look like through building a project if it's geared towards your future career. And it really helps in the future when you have to talk to interviewers. You have a great example and proof that you know what you're talking about. Next, learn GitHub or some form of version control. It will save you so much time in the long run and you'll likely use it in your future role. Instead of having to lose all your progress in a project that you were doing or control Z until like a hundred times, having version control allows you to go back even months in, into the past of a project that you've been working on and revert back to certain files that in functions that you liked back in your code. So I highly, highly recommend taking the time to learn it. Next, learn how to use your IDE or otherwise known as the integrated development environment. Look into the settings and test to see how your debugger works. This will help you troubleshoot your projects. It'll help you in your classes as well. And it'll help you code more effectively. Additionally, some interviews make you use your IDE while coding. And if you don't know how this works, you'll be stuck trying to troubleshoot it in the middle of the interview. This is a real world example because it happened to me and it was very awkward. So I <laughs> would recommend trying to figure out how to use your IDE. Um, it'll save you in the long run. Next we have uh, the resources that you can use for your projects. Now, schools and libraries often offer plenty of discounted and free access to tutorials, books, and software. So take advantage of it while you can. Um, I've got, for example, here the GitHub Student Pack. You can download IDEs that are often really expensive for no price or tons of other materials or other software like web free web services or domain names. There's a whole variety of things that you can get, um, not to mention the free student GitHub membership. Um, so I highly take, uh, highly recommend to take a look into that. And lastly, when it comes to learning, you've heard this, but I'm going to say it again, do it, do your best to ignore people who shame you for learning and who shame you for not having, for, who shame you for taking the time to actually do like learn what you care about. Everyone goes at their own pace. No one's an expert right off the bat. So please do your best to ignore those people who do not support you. Now, after, the, you've, after you've thought of, okay, I want to build a project, it really comes next down, it really comes time to, it really comes down to next, taking the time to document it. Not everyone does this, but I really highly recommend that you start. I did this for one of my Unity projects recently. Unity is a game engine and I built a 3D chicken game in it. it. And it was super, super helpful to document everything that I was learning. It Spending time documenting this personal project made it so much easier for my interviews to talk about things when they were like, oh, what have you built? Tell me a time you faced this problem. You just have all that information there that you've already spent the time to compile. You can share it online. Again, you're sharing, you're sharing what you know. You're helping others learn. And it's again, it's, it's proof that you know what you're talking about. So when it comes to documenting your projects, here's a structure that I followed for my Unity project. I think it could work well for your projects as well, but it, feel free to adapt these things. So at the beginning of your project, you got to think about the project concept, the project timeline, and the draft or sketch. For example, if it's a website, there's a wireframe or 
if it's a game you want to draw what the maybe what the characters were going to look like or the style of the art excuse me this is going to be your overall design document next you're going to have your project tracker now you're going to do this throughout the project you're going to have notes about the progress and the challenges that you do so for example if you got stuck at a certain function that you're trying to implement and you're like oh tomorrow i need to work on this like you can add that all to your to-do list and put that all in your tracker and it can really help you when you go back to look at your timeline to see how much time you originally allocated to adjust for those things so you can get also get a better sense for how long it actually takes you to get projects done uh, next we have the project of review and you want to do this at the end personally i think this is the most important step of all of the documentation because this is the part where you'll use it in interviews and you can share it on social media super super helpful so in my overview for example I had put the time in which I worked on it, the year, how long it took me, just basic description of the project, a couple sentences, the role I played, because perhaps you might do the, do a group project and it helps to keep track of what things you did for that project. Uh, next, the challenges you face. These are generally like technical challenges, uh, the lessons you've learned. These can differ from technical challenges because it could be something related to management or with the way that you worked with people and overcame some challenge that you had with a person, for example. Uh, future improvements, the way that you would change the project you were working on in the future, technical things you'd add, different function, net functionality, et cetera. And the most interesting could be the most interesting function, or sorry, most interesting challenge you faced, or just what you had the most fun with, or I don't know, anything interesting. That one's a little more optional, but um, it can it can just include a variety of things there. So lastly, I'd like to talk about teaching. Again, teaching and sharing your expertise expertise on whatever you learn really just helps to supplement your own learning. So I'd highly recommend becoming a tutor or a TA. It looks super great on resumes. A lot of recruiters will ask for it. You get a chance to practice your communication skills. Uh, and you'll sol uh, solidif solidify what you learn better. Um, and what I mean by when a lot of recruiters will ask for it, they'll just look for it on your resume, but it's not a it's not a requirement necessarily. Now, being a TA is something I wish I would have done. Um, but again, you don't need to have an A in the class to do it. It's just about trying your best when it comes to it. And a great way of trying your best and learning the material and learning how to explain and communicate effectively is, of course, the teaching others. If you can't secure a TA or tutor position or it comes hard, I'd recommend using social media, talking to a friend or a family member, or even practicing by recording yourself. This is something that I did. It's kind of goofy, but you can play it back and hear how you sound and hear how maybe some of the words that you overuse or things that you forgot to admit, et cetera. Be really, a, a really effective tool. All right, so we move on to mistake number three, letting imposter syndrome hold me back. So after deciding to switch into the computer science degree track, I was met with a lot of push back from certain friends and family. I had people tell me I was only going to computer science to take uh, to take take advantage of diversity perks, that I was a poser, and that I was setting up myself up for failure. Uh, coupling this with the fact that there already exists longstanding historical barriers for minorities in tech, it was just really really hard to feel like I was making the right decision in just what I wanted to study. So when I st uh, struggled in my engineering classes, I really started to question myself and my abilities. This questioning continued after my first web developer internship. I felt like I was nothing. <laughs> like every day at work, I was waiting for someone to just come and fire me to tell me that I wasn't good enough that I should just give up now, that like the, the jig is up, you know? <laughs> thankfully, thankfully, I found the support and the help to 
navigate this time and a lot of those really difficult feelings and challenging interactions with the people who didn't support me. Um, and I also know that this experience is not uncommon to, uh, for a lot of minorities in tech. So therefore, in my solution number three here in this presentation, I'd like to explore how to face these challenges and how to equip yourself with ways to combat the negativity. So solution number three, time and practice builds confidence. So to start off talking about imposter syndrome, which some of you may heard have heard before, I hadn't heard of it before entering into computer science, but the definition of imposter syndrome is doubting yourself, your abilities, and feeling overall like you're a fraud. Very much how I like described how I felt in my um, story that I shared right just now. Basically, it's like you don't belong. Now, I felt like an imposter syndrome throughout many stages of my education and career. And while many of those feelings stem from, stem from a lack of confidence in myself, to be honest, um, we can't place the blame entirely on ourselves. There are a, also a lot of structural and systematic barriers like racism, sexism, stereotypes, and prejudice that reinforce this feeling and so they must be acknowledged as well. Um, and while we may not be able to completely overcome imposter syndrome, especially due to some of those outlying factors, I'd still like to try to present some of the ways to get help in spite of it. Now, one of the things that made me feel like an imposter in the industry was not being obsessed or with all aspects of tech or naturally gifted at programming, but as I continued my experience, I learned a lot. Um, as I continued my experience, I've learned a valuable lesson. And that lesson is that passion, just like experience, is built with time. Often, as you master a subject, you often grow more passionate towards it. The same way it's hard to know that you're destined to be a successful writer when you're first learning your letters in grade school, it's also hard to know if you'll love and be great at computer programming when you're still learning the basics of syntax and functional like functions. Once you acquire the fundamentals of a skill, it's way easier to experience the fun and to see all the creative ways you can use code. So just as a reminder, it's okay to go at your own pace. Don't let people bully you for not being passionate enough to be in tech and or try to gatekeep, gatekeep you. I know it can happen and I see it a lot online and I've personally experienced it, but just keep at it and you'll be better off. <laughs> and a way to keep at it is, and be better off is through support. One of the hardest things with imposter syndrome and being bombarded with negativity is the shame and the secrecy felt on the individual level. As if everyone around you is easily swimming a marathon and you're struggling to stay afloat. I know it might feel silly at first, but please talk to somebody. Uh, it was through mentorship, mentorship role models and through connecting with other people with similar experiences to me that I really felt like I could succeed in the world of tech. Those friends that I made who faced those similar challenges to me reaffirmed that I wasn't alone and they really supported me in those times. My role models gave me a ton of inspiration and showed me that despite certain obstacles, you could get to the other side and flourish. And lastly, my mentors, for example, my mentors, Jordan, Nick, Shonda, Mike, I have to give a shout out to them. They gave me a ton of guidance and support and I really, really appreciate all the time that they've given to help me. So just a huge thanks to them and all my supportive friends and family. So I encourage, I, uh, excuse me, I encourage everyone to gather these support structures. You guys are really already head of the game here with Code Labs because they provide you that community of interns and those mentors to work with. So you are off to a great start. Um, and if you'd like to continue looking for other avenues for community and mentors, I recommend that you look into 
certain fellowships and organizations. I've named a couple of the fellowships and organizations that I was a part of here in this slide under community. So for example, I was part a part of Code 2040, which was a fellowship for uh, Black and Latinx students in tech, uh, as well as rewriting the code, which is for a uh, fellowship for women in tech. Hackathons, which I'll talk about later in the presentation, which are a really great way to meet people as well. And then I was also a part of the Microsoft Windows Women in Computing group, which matched me with a bunch of, excuse me, very talented women um, in tech as well. It was um, for Grace Hopper, which is why it was also women focused. <laughs> so, Along with this feeling of imposter syndrome, there can also be other times where this lack of confidence and this uncertainty can pop up, especially for me. Um, and that can come at times where I see and find myself comparing myself to other people a lot. So I wanna talk about delaying full time and not taking the traditional route. It's totally okay. It is totally okay. <laughs> If you haven't, if you don't end up securing a full time position right outside of tech, or you found yourself working outside of tech, even after you graduated with a degree, maybe in computer science or engineering or data science or whatever, um, or say you're living at home with your parents again after graduating, there are plenty of people not taking the traditional route in their careers. I feel like I, when I was in tech, I didn't see that a lot, other than like certain entrepreneurial roles. But I just wanted to say as a reminder, like it is totally okay. Personally, I took a year off to shift my career from front end engineering to virtual reality. I felt less than for a while because I'd graduated and I was working part-time outside of tech, just like as a office assistant. And I was living at home with my parents while my friends had graduated and were off in the Bay Area or New York or Seattle working for these more competitive or prestigious companies. And I, while I was of course happy for them, I really felt like I was just not measuring up. I was somehow behind all over again. But I quickly realized that I had friends who were also in the same position as me. I had plenty of friends who had graduated, were living at home, were working part-time because they hadn't found their dream career like outside of, right outside of college. So, don't don't uh, don't beat yourself up. Keep keep at your goals. You'll get there. It it, it just takes time sometimes. So, so next, sometimes tech can feel like it can kind of turn morph into your entire identity, especially while you're in school. So when things aren't going right with our careers or our education, we can feel like we're nothing but we are so much more than our careers. So I encourage you to learn things outside of tech and strengthen those pillars that make up your identity. When I was in college, I just let those pillars outside of tech fall to the ground. So just as a reminder, take time to explore the world outside of tech. This will help you uh, not only explore your interests, but it also helps you develop your values and what you find important as a person. And when you strengthen those other areas, they also build your confidence because it's a reminder that your whole identity is just not tech. Um, of course, right ways you can do this, read books outside of tech, visit museums, travel, learn from people outside your industry, all great ways. Mistake number four, continuously coming underprepared. My junior year of college, I got a scholarship to attend the Grace Hopper Conference, where over 40,000 women in tech get together. It's a really, really cool event. I was so, so, so thrilled to be there. I was going with other women in from my university. And although I was off to a rough start, I had missed my connecting flight. So I ended up being a day late to the conference, but I still made it. Uh, and so then when I got there, there were things happening all over the place. You had panelist talks, you had recruiting events, and of course, the career fair. 
like many of the students there, I was looking for an internship. So I headed off for the career fair. And as I walked around, I quickly realized I was heavily underprepared. I didn't have any of my resumes printed out. I didn't know what to talk about with the recruiters at all. And I didn't even know what companies I wanted to talk to, let, in, let alone what positions I wanted to work in. Uh, so many of the other women had interviews and had already had them scheduled prior to arriving at the conference. And some even got internships and full-time offers there on the spot at the conference. Very, very talented women. I did my best to spark a company's interest in me, but it was clear I was not getting any offers. <laughs> um, after the conference, thankfully, I was able to secure an internship that I loved, but it was only after applying to 59 companies that summer. While I think it was admirable to stick, it's admirable to stick with your goals, I wish I would have worked smarter rather than harder when it came to landing an internship. If I was better prepared, I could have saved myself a lot of time and headaches. So solution number four, we're gonna talk about your research and being prepared, especially when it comes to careers. To start off, research and learn the distinctions between different tech disciplines and careers such as software engineering, computer science, computer engineering, data science, etc. As someone who is new to all these disciplines, I found it very confusing <laughs> to plan out an idea for my career without having a basic knowledge of the roles I wanted to do. Especially with all these different areas of study and even more directly with my area of study. And then once you take that time to research and narrow it down, then comes to building the resume. Quick tip resumes, there are so many, so many different uh, ideas that people will share and have different standards for. Even if you talk to different companies, different recruiters, they all have different ideas of what makes a good resume. Um, here, I'm just gonna talk about some of the things that I feel like I don't always see when I see people talk about resumes, but that I think are really helpful, quick little tips. So to start off with, remove your full residential address, especially if you post your resume online I personally did not want my residential address out there for the internet and the world to see. So that might be a consideration if you have like a LinkedIn or a website and you posted your resume with your address on it to get that off, especially because a lot of tech companies don't send you snail mail. They will often contact you via, via email. So you're pretty, it, it's safe to assume for at least software engineering roles, you'll be pretty safe in removing that. Plus, you'll make up more space to, for other things that you want to include, or just more digital white space. Easy on the eye. Next, optimize your resume for black and white print. I have seen a couple of people put like highlighter yellow as the nice decorative touch for their resumes. And while it looks super cute and great in color, it just doesn't transfer as well in black and white. And a lot of times, your resume just ends up getting printed in black and white. So make sure if you do add those uh, those artsy touches that you keep that in mind, keep it black, um, optimize it for black and white print. Next up is to prioritize and remove redundancy. If you have too much to put in your resume or two things are very similar, choose one that describes your skills best and is most relevant or is most impressive. I've done a lot of resume reviews for a lot of my peers and some of the quick things that I've noticed is either the languages that they put on, the coding languages they put aren't prioritized in order from left to right in regards to like what they feel most confident in to what they feel least confident in, that's helpful. Um, or underneath each section, so you have like experience, jobs, or sorry, like projects, experience when, when it comes to jobs and so, with each job, they won't put what was the most impressive aspects of the job at the top of their bulleted list. Would really recommend just digging through that. If you try to put yourself in the mind of, of a recruiter and what 
they're going to want to see like they're they're going to be glancing on it really quick so if you have the most impressive stuff first and at the top you're more likely to grab their attention next include buzzwords and appropriate uh, include buzzwords appropriately for online screeners. Oftentimes you have recruiters looking at your resumes. They don't always have a tech background, but they will recognize the buzzwords. And so they can like check that off in their head mentally. Also, sometimes a recruiter doesn't even see your resume. It's not a person who sees your resume first. It's a bot. So if you optimize your resume for buzzwords, you're more likely to get a real person interview. Next, anything you put on your resume is fair game. So try to only include stuff on your resume that you feel comfortable talking about in depth. I made the mistake of putting a project that I was a group project in, but I had a very minor role in it. And so when I was asked about it in an interview, I had barely any answers for it. Like I had contributed, but it was so minimal that I just, I just felt really dumb in the interview. And I wish I did not put that on my resume. So keep that in mind. If you are debating putting something, how much can you talk about it? We're gonna go on to talking about career fairs and conferences now. Now, these are really great ways to interview and find opportunities. There are lots of great scholarships because these conferences can be really pricey. Um, these scholarships can cost uh, cover your like food, your flight, your ticket entry, sometimes only part of it. There's a variety of things, so I definitely take a look. Um, but, and these conferences are often given by companies like Microsoft, or maybe they're given by your school, et cetera. So some of the conferences that I went to that I would highly recommend would include the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing, also known as the Grace Hopper Celebration. I got a picture of the logo in the corner. Super fun, super great way to meet other women in tech, super great way to, um, super great way to talk to recruiters, super great way to learn new things in tech, highly, highly recommend. And then next I have the Tapia Conference, which is a long name, the second long name. <laughs> I have to give a shout out to Tapia. They take in um, a larger demographic of people. Um, and, I personally was able to secure an internship via Co2040, which I had found their booth, their table booth at the Tapia conference. So I have to give a shout out to Tapia because it was thanks to them that I was able to land an internship my junior year. Next up, many of the conferences and these companies uh, have a interview, interviewer, uh, a potential interview portal. So you can submit your resume into this database. And even if you don't attend the conference, you can still have a chance to interview with companies and get a better chance of scheduling an interview. If you do decide to go to the conference, scheduling your interviews in advance. Hey, Monica, um, oh. I'm going to interrupt you really quick. We have a, a question that just came up. Um, somebody wants to know um, what you mean exactly by buzzwords. Do you have any examples of that? Oh, sure thing. Um, so when I talk about buzzwords, I mean things that, um, like, for example, the programming languages, it was, it's almost like the skills. So for example, if I am writing a resume bullet point, I'll put, um, so like for my Unity game, right? Built a 3D world using Unity, that would be a buzzword, and C Sharp, that would be another buzzword. Because when a recruiter is looking down the line, they're gonna look at like, okay, what's what languages do you know? What software do you know? What um, frameworks do you know? Like Agile or Scrum or whatever. Um, uh, so those would be some of the buzzwords or Git, Linux, Windows, or more so Linux and Unix systems, things that, especially if they apply directly to the role, you might see when you go to the application page, it'll be like, must have these skills, like C Sharp, Unity, VR experience, um, <laughs> Git, 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 like those would all be, I would say those would all be like buzzwords. 
hope that answers the question. If there's still questions about that, I am happy to talk about that some more. Um, should I go and answer the other questions now as well, or should I wait till the end? Let's wait till the end. Thank you for answering that question. Yeah, sure thing. Oh, I just skipped forward. Okay. Um, all right, so talking about, excuse me, researching the companies and the positions of the companies you want to work for before arriving at the event. Again, when I went to these conferences, I just was like, oh, I'm just going to go and see what's there, um, which isn't, you know, this isn't bad, but if you have a game plan, I would take a look at the conference for, uh, floor plan layout and plan which companies that you want to prioritize talking to. It can help to have this game plan because some of the companies have more people and are more competitive, like Microsoft or Google. So if you spend all your time waiting in line for them, but then you also want to talk to these smaller companies, you might not get the chance to do both. And these are the same, and this is the same when it comes to career fairs, even at your school, like my school would always of course, have a line for Microsoft. So you, some people would sacrifice all their time just to talk to Microsoft, but ignore like all the other 30 companies that were at the career fair. So it help, again, helps to have a game plan. Now, okay, this last point, this might just be advice from my younger self, but talk about the projects and the work experience you have not about how much time you spend on lead code working on coding challenges. I have told this to recruiters at career fairs thinking that it was very impressive and like their eyes would just gloss over. They would not care. <laughs> it was very uncomfortable <laughs> to be honest. So I recommend uh, talk about the projects and your previous work experience, not how much you're trying to learn data structures. Like a, you have to keep it like a secret that you're like you both know what's going on, but yeah. <laughs> All right, so next, let's talk about job applications. So my biggest tip for applying for job applications is to apply early. That means as early as July, August, sometimes even June, um, if possible. In the earlier months, especially, a lot of companies have more space and resources to hire, so your chances of getting a job are so much higher. I would say the bulk majority of these positions really open up around October, maybe sometime in the fall, but companies like, um, I think like Microsoft, for example, uh, they, they, they just start opening their positions early. So if you are on top of it, you can have your internship for the next summer, like during the summer, during that same summer that you're working for a different company, um, can really, really save you a lot of headache during the school year while you're trying to balance class and getting a job. <laughs> Next, use a job application tracker, tracker to stay on, to stay organized. Personally, I created my own job application tracker to stay organized. I'm happy if anyone is interested to email you guys the template I created for myself. Um, and if you're anything like me, you'll find it really helpful and easier just to stay on top of things. Oh no, my computer is gonna die. I'll be right back. <laughs> Okay, crisis averted. Um, sorry about that. Um, having a job application tracker will help you to remember what stages of the interview process you are, uh, you're in, especially if you're having multiple companies, maybe some companies haven't gotten back to you for a while. Having the application tracker can just be like a good reminder, like, oh, I should reach out to them. They haven't talked to me. <laughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> Next, update your LinkedIn. I've had recruiters and interviewers right before my interviews with them check this out to kind of get a sense of like who I am. And I'll see it It'll like ping in my notifications like, oh, this person checked out your interview or checked out your profile. So sometimes you even get job recommendations via LinkedIn. I know I have. So make sure you also have that you're open to receiving those opportunities. <laughs> Um, these last two, 
bullet points I have here on the left are not as much of a priority, but I think they do really help you stand out. Uh, so building a website for yourself, if you decide to do it via WordPress or build it from scratch, I built mine from scratch, but again, originally I wanted to go into front end development. So it, I, it would be, it was a great project for me to like learn those skills. Um, but having a website for yourself can help when recruiters and interviewers are researching into your background and you have this really nicely formatted experience that they can look into. And then as well, it just makes you look more put together and makes you stand out a lot more because not everyone has their own website. Um, next, having a professional photo and hand. On LinkedIn, you need to use a professional photo and a lot of times there will be strange opportunities that will come up that you just didn't expect but that are totally you're totally pumped about that you need to have a really nice photo. So if you if your school or something has like a photography room or you have a friend who's just really good with their iPhone or their Android or whatever, take some nice professional photos and keep that. I use, I took my <laughs> my aunt took um my senior photos <laughs> back when I was in high school and I still use that as my professional photo because <laughs> they looks really nice and I, I, I like you can't tell that um it looks very professional and really nice my aunt had like a really high quality camera so it served me for what like when I was high school it's like six years now like that's top notch <laughs> Um, next, I want to talk about some of the opportunities because I know when I was looking for internships as a sophomore, I was like, oh, all these jobs only say they want a junior. Like, this is so annoying. Like, how do I find an internship? Well, when it comes to that problem, uh, one would recommend looking locally. A lot of you'll you'll have better chances locally, excuse me, um, at finding a job sophomore year. That's what I ended up doing. I worked at a local startup working as a web developer startups a really great way to get that experience because they they're they're generally not as like picky as some of these larger companies not always um but you also learn a lot again totally different ball game it's a good idea to try to test out these different like size companies if you can um but back to the opportunities i've listed here some freshman and sophomore opportunities that they have these university programs that have other freshmen and sophomores, and they'll only take freshmen and sophomores. So you have a way better chance than competing with seniors and juniors, et cetera. So you have, for example, the Microsoft Explorer program, which I had interviewed for, I did not get it, but it was really cool. Um, the Facebook university program, Google engineering Practi practicum, I had a friend do that, really loved it. Uh, you have the Google Summer of Code, Twitter Academy, Code 2040 uh, Fellows program, I also did this program. The beauty of this program is you can actually do it, like you can do it sophomore and junior year. I'm not sure about freshman year, but it's uh, really nice. Uh, Intel Early Internship for Software Engineering, Pinterest Engage Internship, and the Khan Academy Internships, and then also NASA Internship, which my friend uh, worked for NASA and now he's working there full-time. So worked out well for him. <laughs> Next, we're, let's talk about interviews, the scariest part of the internship of the, of the job process, in my opinion. <laughs> when it comes to interviewing, it really helps to have a game plan. It makes it so much less scary. Prepare, prepare, prepare. If you're looking to, into, to get into a SWE role, uh, so SWE stands for software engineering role especially, focus on learning the structure the function, the time complexity, the space complexity of your data structures and algorithms. When you know how to implement these data structures and functions, uh, these data structures and these algorithms from scratch, you will stand out. You will look very impressive to your interviewer. So you so here's a great resource for learning these things. You may have heard of this book before. It's constantly recommended. I personally had not heard of it ever until a couple, like a year into my computer science journey. But Cracking a Coding Interview by Gail McDowell is the, I would say like the book that you'll always hear. It will teach you everything you need to know about interviewing and it'll give you the 
uh, and it'll also help you practice your fundamentals uh, for coding challenges. She even goes in and talks about like how to how to go about your behavioral interviews, which is really helpful as well. And she talks about, especially with some of the more popular companies, like what certain companies look for, like Google will ask you a lot of questions about um, like tree graphs, I think it is, um, versus Microsoft, versus Facebook, versus Amazon, versus whoever. Um, and she also has other books like Cracking the PM Interview, et cetera. Next, if you're looking for a great website to practice your coding interviews, I would highly recommend Leak Code. Leak Code is basically just like a text editor online, but you, but I mean, it compiles codes, so maybe not, but it essentially allows you to practice your coding, uh, coding questions. Now you can, it's free, but you can buy a subscription for it. It is expensive. So if you do, I would recommend splitting that between friends because it's like $130 or something like that. Um, but it's really nice because a lot of the questions that they ask you on the website, I've had interviews where they will actually ask me questions that they ask me on Leak Code. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, I already did this. Like I know how to answer this. <laughs> um, and those really, really came in handy. So would recommend. Uh, now, if you want to practice your interviewers and for some reason you have a friend who's not available or like a family member who's not available, but you want to practice explaining and talking out your interview, excuse me, your interview out loud, I'd recommend interviewing.io. There are many other websites like this that you'll see recommended. This is just one I've personally used that allows you to do mock interviews. They sent me up with an anonymous person in the industry and that person would be, I think he worked at like LinkedIn, uh, not LinkedIn, uh, Netflix. And he would give me feedback as to like areas that I can improve and things to work on for next time. And so, yeah, that's just a really, really great method to um, have that practice. Cause a lot of your interviews will, interviews will first be over the computer like this, like via Zoom and they then they might go on, on site, but most of them are gonna be like this. Next, when it comes to interviews, when you land one, check if it's going to be like what type of interview it's going to be. Uh, check if it's going to be informational, behavioral, or technical. A uh, recruiter should let you know this, but throughout the interview process, you'll usually have a combination of the three where the first interview is going to be informational. They just want to get to know you, um, like your degree, you're looking for your year in school, et cetera. And then they'll usually be technical questions. Your, uh, it'll be technical interviews after that. So sometimes that can be one technical interview. So I, I, when I interviewed with one company, they had me do three. Um, and each of those interviews were like two hours long. So this is, you know, black out a good time chunk to be answering coding challenges for one to two hours. Um, and then the last, if some, not every company use, does this, but some of them do, they'll have behavioral interviews where they'll ask, in the technical interviews, they just really just jump into the coding challenges. But in the behavioral interviews, they'll ask you more like, oh, tell me a time you had a hard time with a team member or like face this challenge, et cetera. So it'll be more of those just getting to know you and how you work and what you want questions. Um, Yeah, and then on top of that, some of your some of the companies you apply for will before you even get a chance to interview will send you a coding challenge, so just be prepared for that. Um, it, or it could even be a take home project. That's not too unusual. Just um, yeah, that's again why lead code can be really helpful because it'll help with those online coding challenges where you're not talking to anybody, and a lot of those challenges have timers, so you have like one hour to get like one coding challenge done or two hours to get four done. And they're all varying difficulty. Yeah, you can have a lot of differences there. Last or second to last, practice coding without a whiteboard and without an IDE. Again, an integrated development environment. Many companies will have you do interviews on a simple text file. Uh, I had an interview with 
Google my senior year, I think, and it didn't go well, but <laughs> they had me do it over like Google Docs. So <laughs> you have no autofill, you really are just, ju it's just basically, you might as well like, yeah, it's, I mean, it was, it was just, I, you just had like your own knowledge of the code. So practice, practice outside of your IDE because it'll help you learn how to debug and it'll learn, help you learn how to walk through code. You'll be able to survive the Google Docs interview. <laughs> okay, lastly, this is a, maybe a, a little bit of a stranger one to mention, but I think it's worth mentioning. If you have an on-site interview, beware of jet lag. I never thought of this before interviewing, but arrive early, like, but if you have an interview on site, arrive a day early or try to adjust your sleep schedule before you go so you can be better adjusted to the time zone. Sleep is so important. And I would come to these interviews and go to the, like the night before, go to the hotel, not be able to sleep at all. I'm a very light sleeper. And I would just be so stressed the next day. One time I like ended up being 20 minutes late to my interview, very bad. When, uh, when I slept poorly, I, I really couldn't figure out where my interview was. I just couldn't think. It, it just all went, went very poorly for me. So I would recommend figuring all that, being prepared the night before. So, cause you, it, it might be hard to rely on getting a good night's sleep. Um, if you uh, wanna know the book, Cracking the Coding Interview, I have that here in the left-hand left -hand corner, Leak Code here, their logo. If you're looking to just like, oh, what is it gonna look like? There it is. All right, lastly, there's a lot I can say on internships, um, but I'm just gonna share this one little tidbit. If you have a company, you know you wanna work for post-grad, try and get an internship the year before you graduate. So that way you have better chances of getting a full-time return offer, uh, especially just a full-time offer in general compared to new people applying into the full-time position. Often the full-time interview process is all is often harder as well than the internship process. So if you just get like grandfathered in, you have a way less stressful senior year. I had friends who just like accepted their return offers at the companies they wanted to work for and they were cruising, having a good time senior year. You know, I was stress stressing I because I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do on top of finals and everything. All right, so on to the last mistake. Pulling weekly all-nighters. Now, again, my sophomore year was rough. I was taking my first computer science class and I had just terrible habits. This led me to do my assignments the night before they were due in the morning. Code, and coding is not like writing a paper where you can just call it finished if when you feel like it looks good. As you know, coding is much more binary and black and white than that especially if your code doesn't compile and pass all the necessary points, you don't get the points. <laughs> you don't get the points if your program does not pass those tests. Uh, so when it came to your coding assignments, I would stay up every night, every week, when each weekly assignment was due, working to pass all the program tests. And often this meant I was staying up way until the next morning, until like 9 a.m., right before I had to go to my other class. This is a terrible way to go to college. I hated Tuesday mornings. I was always so tired, <laughs> which my own fault. And on top of that, on the weekends, I started going to hackathons. Now, hackathons are computer coding competitions. I mentioned them a little bit briefly uh, earlier, but at hackathons, you're encouraged to stay up all weekend long with no sleep and just program. So I would stay up the whole weekend, sometimes often like one, two, or sometimes again, three days of the week, just not sleeping. Um, <laughs> I would come back to school so tired. I had no energy to cook or to exercise. I would just eat unhealthy, easy foods that I didn't have to put a lot of effort into. It was, it was, it was very awful for my health. Tech and, and poor organization, tech and poor organizational habits were completely ruining my life sophomore year. Um, 
personally, I feel like tech can promote this hustle culture when where where you're not supposed to sleep and you're just supposed to code all day. But I really encourage you, especially when it comes to school and career, to start implementing boundaries and to take care of yourself in a world that never wants you to sleep. <laughs> so on to solution number five, take care of yourself. And one area that can invade your boundaries when it comes to sleeping is hackathons. Although not a must to be successful in tech, hackathons are a great way to meet people in the industry to build a project and to really honestly have a great time. I've, I've gone to like 10 hackathons and I had an awesome time at so many of them. And I met a lot of really great friends. So if you're interested in hackathons, I've got some tips for you. Number one, apply early to hackathons. Kind of like jobs, it's where like there are more spots at the beginning and they fill up fast, especially for more competitive hackathons like Stanford's hackathon or Harvard's or most of the Ivy League schools, honestly. Um, and same with like Champaign, Champaign Urbana, their hackathon was also pretty, um, would get full pretty fast. And now a way to, not every hackathon is through this website major or, or through this organization, but a lot of them are through major league hacking. Would highly check, uh, recommend scanning their website. They post, excuse me, they post a majority of the hackathons and have links to their websites, uh, to the schools that host them. Next, plan, plan an idea of what you wanna do before you go, especially if you're more concerned about your sleep and your health when you're going there. So for example, the questions that uh, would be helpful to plan out would be like, do you wanna build something there? You don't have to, you could just work on homework. Will you need a team? What skills will you need help with? What skills are you looking for in a teammate essentially? Are you looking to win any big prizes? Sometimes they offer a wide variety of project prizes and um like for example a friend and I, a friend and friend and I came in with like the like a competitive more of a competitive mindset and we were able to each win two echo dots which was pretty cool made for a great christmas present for my parents <laughs> um so yeah prizes can be really cool uh next are you looking to go and just do homework kind of like i mentioned before totally okay um, I've also done that. <laughs> and lastly, are you or are you just looking to go have fun? Like all things to all things worth considering. Um, and then along with those con project considerations, um, oh, by the way, you cannot start working on a hackathon project before the hackathon. That is something worth mentioning, like no coding before the hackathon. But having ideas and ideating, pretty sure that's okay. Now, for hackathons, um, preparation, uh, a lot of hackathons don't provide a place to sleep or feel refreshed. So I would highly recommend, like it's not uncommon to bring a sleeping bag, a pillow, an eye mask, earbuds, deodorant, toothbrush. I, I bring like a mini suitcase every time I went to a hackathon or like a pretty stuffed bag um, with like a blanket and like a lot of these things. Um, just again, because they don't, they don't always turn off the lights or um, it can get really loud at these hackathon events with like a ton of people. So if you're looking for sleep, would recommend. Boundaries. Let's talk about your health because while work is important, it can consume all of your energy and leave you just with the remains, just kind of spitting you out. So please, this, this is the last, this is the last plea for you all uh, here on this slide. Please don't sacrifice your physical and mental health. Sleep well, eat well, exercise. It'll pay so much dividends down the line, especially, you know, you never know what happens to your job. Um, but you'll have it, you know, you'll you'll be stuck, you're gonna be stuck with your own health, right? So it's it's important to take care of yourself in that way. Um, if you have the if if you can afford to do that, I realize it could be really hard. If you're oh, one, sorry, one of the best books that has taught me the value of sleep and that I would highly recommend, this is like a top top tier five star, five out of five star book for me that I would recommend on the value 
uh, that I would recommend on talking about the value of sleep is called Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. It tells you like how, why we're such a sleep deprived society and like why you might still be taking, uh, waking up tired, even though you slept eight hours, like you're like, oh, I'm doing everything right. Like, why am I still so tired? Rec, I, or like, like I would recommend this book. <laughs> so that's the image I have here in the corner. Next, when it comes to getting things done, finish is better than perfect. It can be really easy to become like a perfectionist and tinker with things, especially, you know, if we have a week to do something, we'll spend that whole week working on it instead of getting it done when, when we have the capacity, instead of like when we have the capacity to get it done in a day and just being satisfied with it. No one to, no one enough is enough, especially when you have other things that are priorities in your life and that you wanna work on. Next up, take breaks. When you really want to succeed, it can often feel like there's no room for sleep. It's socializing, exercising, or relaxing, all these things that help you prioritize your health. And this can quickly lead to feeling overwhelmed and experiencing burnout. A lot of the times when I was in college, I would feel so busy and I would just like, again, just sacrifice all these things. And I think it really made my grades suffer a lot more. Um, and I just had more times where I find myself like crying at night because I was so stressed. Um, next up, and this one especially applies when you get into the job market, especially at this time where everyone's working from home, like for myself, I work from home, teach others to respect your time. Practicing communicating to others your boundaries when you feel like you're taking on too much work or find yourself answering work emails or calls on the weekends. It will help you, it'll just help in the long run so other people can get a sense of like, okay, like I'm not gonna try to contact her or him or them or whatever, like at this time. Um, but like I said, I work remote, so there are no differences between like, this is my office and my house. So, um, I am personally constantly striving to improve because it's so easy to like be laying in bed at midnight and still be answering work emails, um, especially if your team works asynchronously like my team does. So we all live at different areas in the United States and all get time at different, all get work done at different times. It's totally okay to set boundaries and say no. Um, lastly, celebrate. So brave. Okay. <laughs> Reward yourself for finishing something you worked hard on. Whether it be a small break or a month long sabbatical or longer, while working, it can be so easy to forget to celebrate the small wins and like give yourself a pat on the back, you know? Like you work hard. Like after this internship, I hope you all give yourself a pat on the back. You worked hard because it always feels like there's so much left to do in that, oh, well, it wasn't that impressive. Like, they all, this person like, I don't know, like <laughs> flew to the moon, like I didn't do that or, you know, but you do, you recognize when you work hard, you know, like give yourself props, you guys are doing great. And that's something that I know I have to constantly remind myself to do. So give yourself a pat on the back every once in a while. So to review all of our solutions that we talked about, transform your habits, numero uno. Number two, don't wait to be an expert. Share what you're learning now. Next, uh, time and practice builds your confidence. You don't have to be an expert. And the more you practice, the more confident you feel. Four, research and prepare. Continuously prepare. Yeah, research and prepare. And then lastly, take care of yourself. Thank you guys so much. Thank you guys again for giving me the opportunity to talk with you all here today. I feel very, very grateful. And again, I hope that something was valuable out of this <laughs> talk for you guys. Um, and here are the books mentioned that I have for you as well. Highlighted here below are all, or the ones bolded are the ones that I personally would most recommend. Um, and uh, yeah. If you have any questions for me, I'd love to answer them. Feel free to contact me on LinkedIn. Um, let's let's chat. <laughs>
Awesome. Thank you so much, Monica. Your speech was, your presentation was really awesome. And it had really helpful information, especially about like burnout and like imposter syndrome. I mean, all of those things like so many people experience. I mean, I'm not a coder, but um, as an artist, definitely oh, yeah. imposter syndrome is so real. Um, <laughs> and there's so much to compare yourself to nowadays. Um, before technology, I'm sure people were, you know, happily making art, minding their own business without <laughs> thousands of other artists to compare themselves to. <laughs> yeah, looking at all the likes, being like, oh, mine only got two, even though I spent like 40 hours making this beautiful masterpiece. Like, yeah, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. But anyway, let's um, move on to Q&A. Um, we do have a few questions here rolling in. Let's um, let's start with, well, Stephen did write a comment saying, um, in addition to mistake number two, he would even go as far as to say that helping others is one of the best ways to further your learning in the sub in a subject. Yes, hundred percent agree with that. That is a mis and that is something that I, I don't know. It's easy. It it can seem so obvious, but like I know for myself that like, I just did. I I didn't do that. And so I would look at everyone who I was like, oh, wow, they're like so smart. They really know what they're talking about. And they would, they were always like teaching others. They'd been a tutor. They had, or just one of those people who kind of just start explaining things. Um, and so, yeah, I totally agree. I totally, totally agree. It is a great way to master a subject. Yeah. Which is why I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to be, get more comfortable speaking and sharing things about what I've learned. Um, even even if I'm just starting to learn them now, another book, honestly, that I'd recommend. This is also awesome for our artists as well. Show your work. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, the name of the book. Uh, I can't remember the name of the. Let me think. The show. Oh no, wrong. Um, that's okay. I can't find the name of the author at the moment, but um, he talks about documenting your work, at least in the context of being an artist, and how. Yeah, kind of like what I talked about today, where it can just help you find a community and help you gain more knowledge and confidence. Yeah, being a thought leader is super important. And like, as long as you find a community that you can share your work with and like get that feedback, it's way more valuable than likes and comments. Like, oh, yeah. genuine feedback is going to help you so much more than just putting it up and like waiting. Um, we all... Um, I feel are really used to getting like instant gratification yes, with a like or a follow and that's all we really seek out it's like chasing up like a high or you know chasing that dopamine hit in your brain like oh somebody liked it but um yeah you'll get way more satisfaction from a community of people that will support you Hence why we have a Code Day Discord. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, <laughs> no, I totally agree. Like <laughs> with my Unity project that I built, the chicken game, um, I posted it on LinkedIn. And I got so much feedback from a lot of my friends. They were like, oh, it'd be so cool if you did this. Your game is a little too hard in this way. And it was like really great ways to know how to like tune my tune when I was building. And I actually posted it on this other website. It's for like indie games. I can't remember the name. But a random person commented on it. They were like, nice job. And I was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> the validation. I mean, it wasn't feedback, but it, it was it was like really exciting. <laughs> it is. But yeah, it's that dopamine hit. It was like the like a like almost. <laughs> we all know. We all know the dopamine life. Oh yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, somebody asks, is it possible to have this PowerPoint after the talk? Sure. Um, yeah, we'll I'll get the PowerPoint and we'll post it up and share it with everybody. Yeah, I'm glad you guys liked it. <laughs> yeah, it's a great PowerPoint. You all liked it. Um, somebody asks, do you have a specific app to track the progress or challenges you're facing during your project or do you just write it in a Word document? Yeah, so I will include, so I created a, I uh, created a Google Excel sheet and like created some custom formulas that I use to track my the jobs I was applying for so I will include a link of it in the I'll give a link to to you guys to y'all and then I'll also include a link of it in the PowerPoint 
presentation. So that way, if you ever just want to like have the presentation on hand, you can like click it and you can make a copy of it and use it for yourself. Um, I'm sure there's software out there, but this was just like a, I, I don't know. I like creating like my own custom things. Like, so um, yeah, I use that. I use, I use a custom job application tracker. <laughs> That's cool. Um, do you have any tips on how w we can get hired for internships on the spot remotely due to COVID? Ooh. So, I'm, I guess closest thing I could relate to that because I, y'all are in a lot more unique of a position than I was. I graduated in 2019, so that was way before the, uh, so that was before the pandemic. It was graduated in the summer. So I missed the pandemic by like a good couple months. <laughs> <laughs> I really feel for you guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but so I was looking for full time a full time position though during the pandemic. There were way less jobs available, and again, I spent that time building my Unity game, and that's when I spent time documenting ev documenting everything. And I posted a LinkedIn post on my website and on my on that indie game site, like. Oh, and on unity.com um, about my project. And a CEO reached out to me just out of the blue and was like, hey, I want to talk to you. Like, I found you on Unity and I see you also live near the area. Like, do you want to work for us? And I was like, oh my God, I'm so glad I posted my game. Like, this is so exciting. Like, oh my gosh, like, I'm so excited. So Honestly, I really, really recommend just like putting yourself out there when it comes to building your projects. You never know who's going to see it. Um, in my case, I got a job offer out of it in the in the very difficult niche of virtual reality. So that was super, super exciting for me. Um, especially because my experience with virtual reality wasn't the most extensive, probably compared to a lot of the candidates that they they had applying. Um, so yeah, that would be my best tip. Yes, definitely. And um, to add to that, like, yeah, build a website, build a, sim even if it's simple, build a website, put your stuff on it, keep updating it. Mm -hmm. um, even though you don't, I mean, if it's hard for you to understand SEO, um, there's definitely sites that help you with that, um, which is a way for you to be found on Google. Um, and yeah, just like get it started. Even if you don't, if you, even if you just have like the bare bones, the front part <laughs> as long as somebody can see your portfolio that's what's really important yeah i do you mind if i actually add a little bit real quick sure. i do have a, a couple of friends who had cold email but they they would have, have really concise emails with like a project that they would talk to exactly not like the ceo but say it was the company and the team uh, they were, they would be really specific in who they would want to talk to. And they would ask like, Hey, um, if you're looking, if you're looking for somebody with this, here's my skills, like, here's my, here's a project I did. Let me know if you're interested. So, um, although I wouldn't do that too much, like to the same person, you don't want to like create a bad relationship. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt to cold, to cold, um, not like cold call, but like cold email and cold message on LinkedIn. Um, uh, especially if you have a project, people want to connect. It, it's a lot easier to, again, you just have proof that like, oh, I have the skills. I could do it. Like, look at me. I'm such an easy hire. Like, <laughs> um, plus it's just fun. It's like fun to learn. Thank you for adding to that. Um, yeah, sure thing. there's uh, so many questions now. <laughs> Let me see. Um, <laughs> I'm going to answer them all. Let's go with, what did you do to prevent yourself from getting burnt out in addition to taking breaks? Ooh, so honestly, it started with slowing down. I would cut myself out of a lot of my social media. So I would experiment with not being on YouTube and 
not being on like Twitter or in, like, in, well, I personally, I don't use Instagram, but like Instagram and mm-hmm. all these sites because I know, uh, because I just noticed that I would start to feel like really anxious and more like scatterbrained and more ramped up the more that I use these websites. I mean, these websites are just meant to keep you engaged. They're not meant to help you like feel good in particular. So uh, just honestly, I would test out stepping away from social media just for a week. Um, I would still use like, mess- like, I personally would like still use Messenger, but like at, at this point, like I, I just don't use Facebook. I don't use Instagram, um, YouTube as well. Like these are all websites that if when you take a break for them, you'll, it'll really clear your headspace. Um, especially because like for me, I would spend hours, like, <laughs> like my average like watch time on some of these like sites was like, it was bad. It was like, like, nine hours a day like eight nine hours a day it's like how did i where did i like i would sacrifice sleep to to go watch vine like uh, (laughs) um so um yeah it really can help you refocus other than that um i am someone who when i'm working i have a hard time like sticking with something for a really long time so if i need a break don't, I don't go on my phone because going on my phone means like I'm going to spend an hour and a half on my phone. So instead I'll just like go and sit and close my eyes and do nothing just for like 15 minutes. Eventually I might like get bored or maybe I'll like fall asleep. That's okay. Um, Cause then I'll come back and I'll feel way more rejuvenated and I can go about the things that I want to do for a lot longer of a period of time. Um, and then honestly, the other two things like I know these sound like such like like common things that you hear the, all the time, and I I'm probably gonna I'm, I probably sound preachy, but <laughs> but exercising really gave me a ton of energy. It helped me sleep better, um, exercising more regularly, and then I also find myself craving less unhealthy food, which is weird. Um, it helped me eat better, and that helped me have more energy, and it all cycles. So <laughs> so yeah, I would, honest, all that helps into being more relaxed. But so, I know how hard that is to do in college. Honestly, I don't think I was able to do it very well in college at all. No, definitely not. You will want potato chips and you will not want to leave your couch. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, if- yeah. I, I was amazed at my friends who like, uh, had the discipline to work out in the mornings. But that was smart because, of course, all your friends want to hang out at night. Yeah, right. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there's a few more, um, job related questions. Yeah. Um, do you have tips for finding the right first job? Um, not overwhelming, but plenty of room to learn, grow in bigger or smaller companies. Are they better? I feel like smaller companies are better to start with, right? Yeah. So I, I, I actually, so I worked at a uh, startup of <laughs> four people. I then worked at a medium-sized company at TaskRab, which was about 200 people. And then I worked at Autodesk, which was like thousands of people. So I've had some experience in like, in those extremes. And then of course there's like even bigger companies like Microsoft. But um, personally, I felt like actually the medium-sized company, like 200 people was the perfect size for me because you have, the company is structured well enough that you have mentor- mentorship, which that is something I would definitely ask about before applying to any company, especially if you're um, struggling. Because like in my, co- the first company I worked at, that was only four people. I, I just, I felt like I was adrift on the ocean. Like I didn't feel like I had a structured sense of support. So I, don't feel like I learned as much and um, had as great of a time compared to my intern my inter- internship at TaskRabbit. Um, I had a really great mentor, Jordan, who I got help and feedback every day. And I mean, also, I mean, I hate to say, but there's also like a couple more perks. Like I got free lunch. Like that was cool. Like <laughs> as an intern, like that was like, hey, saving money. <laughs> So that's also a perk, I think, like, 
you know, obviously at the bigger companies, you have even more of that, but at the medium companies, I had much more control over what I did and some of the suggestions people like cared about what I, what I thought about. Um, and yeah, I just had more to say at the bigger companies. I, um, I was working on something that was like, so menial, like, like it just like, didn't seem like it mattered. I had such a hard time caring about it. Um, and a lot of my friends who worked at like bigger companies like Microsoft or like Google, like said the same thing, like as an intern, sometimes you just like, especially the bigger companies, they just put you somewhere without even having planned where they need help. Yeah. They'll yeah. make up a project for you. My friend who worked at Microsoft ended up rebuilding something that two other interns had rebuilt before him the previous, like previous summers. And he, he was like, Okay, hey, or uh, yeah, or people have already built this and it already failed. And his his manager was like, "Yeah, I don't care, just build it." Like, <laughs> yeah. So, and, and I'm not saying all like all build company uh, big companies are not uh, are like this. Like Microsoft, please don't come and sue me or something. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like <laughs> no defamation here. But <laughs> I'm just sharing the experiences of the like the friends I had in my own experience at the larger companies. Um, although. Another trade-off is at the bigger company, I had a large group of interns I could be friends with, and I loved my the other interns. Um, where as a medium at the medium company, like I just there wasn't as large of a group. And of course, at the small company, at the four-person company, like if you aren't the same age or like really tight with the other people at the company, it's gonna feel pretty lonely. So um yeah, I would all take that into consideration when you're thinking about a job. But overall, I would say the medium-sized company for a first time. Uh, I hope that answered the question, that I didn't miss anything there. That's sound advice. I nice. answered the question. Um, let's answer one more question because we're a little over time by a lot. Sorry. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's see a really important sounding question. Yeah, feel free to message me your questions, by the way. I'm happy to answer them on LinkedIn or email or uh, if you search my name, my website should pop up so you can find me that way too. Yeah, you don't even have to put the accent. You could just put Monica instead of Monica. Great. Um, thank you for saying that because we yeah. have more questions. Um, okay, for a beginner, going into the tech field, how do you plan out and balance trying to search for jobs, working on site projects, preparing for technical interviews, et cetera, while in school? Oof. I feel you. If I were this, I feel you. Like, <laughs> this is one of the biggest struggles I <laughs> um, So again, the job application tracker helps. Learning organizational habits help. Um, so if you can get ahead of your, in your classes in the beginning, maybe when like a, not a lot of jobs are open or start again, start, if you start applying for jobs early in September, and especially if you already have an internship lined up, like, boom, that immediately takes off having to like worry about jobs during the whole semester while you're interviewing and doing classes. So doing stuff earlier, the better. Um, next, I, I would really recommend looking into, if you're someone like me who likes to write their calendars down, a bullet journal. Bullet journaling, I've found the most effective way. I've had a lot of calendars throughout my life, but like this is the one I've stuck with the longest. Um, and it's just a method to keep track of your to-do lists and prioritize things. Um, and then there's also, um, what is that called? It's when you, uh, there's an, it's a name for it. It's called, um, I think it's called time slotting, but you essentially tell yourself like, okay, I'm going to set, I'm going to spend two hours on getting this coding project done but you don't just like keep it vague like that you like specifically say what you're going to get done and then you don't go over that time so that way oh, it's called time blocking you don't go over that time and then from there you are like okay now i'm going to spend time working on projects 
So that is also another method. But what, especially when it comes to projects, I would recommend doing that in the summer. In the, in, in the summer, you'll have a lot more time to focus on coding challenges, to focus on projects. So that way in the school year, you can focus on, um, if you wanna go to hackathons, hackathons, um, class and job interviews. So yeah, that would, that would, I would say that would be my best recommendation. Um, again, less is more when it comes to job interviews. If you learn on, if you learn how to get the fundamentals down, like, you know, get cracking the coding, the coding interview and learn how to answer coding questions, you won't have to spend as much time as like I did every week, sometimes having like three interviews that led nowhere. <laughs> um, so yeah, work smarter, not harder. I work hard, but yeah. dumb. <laughs> um, another, thing, another thing I know that people um, do are they set alarms throughout the day. Yeah. Um, I've set an alarm to literally tell myself to stop working. <laughs> at like 6 p.m. stop working so I can eat and like chill um so yeah even if you need a reminder to like relax if you're a type a personality like me that just has a no chill <laughs> getting an alarm is a really good idea yeah that's perfect and you can even do that too if you're somebody who like struggles to get work done if you've ever I don't know if any of y'all have heard of the pomodoro technique that's p-o-m-o-d-o-r-o -O -O, pomodoro technique that could be a great way to help Get work done um, in small chunks, but then have breaks in between, so it doesn't feel overwhelming, and you can your projects, your interviews, etc. Yeah, because I've been there. It's it is it is a lot to handle. It so is. All right, let's ask one more question. Do your thing. Um. Mm -hmm. What classes for computer science in college do you think were the most impactful and valuable towards programming as a whole? So I would say data structures, for sure. Um, algorithms, although I personally didn't love the way my algorithms classes taught. I know that algorithms um, themselves are often, you'll have a lot of interviews for it and you will find yourself in, in your job. Surprisingly, surprisingly, you'll be like, oh, who knew I had to like implement this, like, um, uh, I don't know, this like linked list structure, like you, you'll end up using, you'll end up actually using it. So I, I would really recommend like putting a lot of time into those classes from there. Um, I, depending on your niche that you're interested in going into, for me, um, computer graphics and linear algebra were really useful to learn about virtual reality. Um, for computer graphics, you need to know about like matrices and how to transform them. So uh, those classes were really helpful. And then, uh, yeah, again, it depends on what you want to go into. If you want to do low level programming, I would recommend compilers, I would recommend learning, um, oh, what was it called? It's, it's like a class, well, for us, it was a class where you learn C and learn about machine organization, that's what it's called um, for, for our university. Um, but it, it teaches you low-level programming. But um, one of the classes, one of the math classes that I would say is the most helpful for teaching logic is discrete math. Now you could also take a, like a philosophy class to help teach you logic, but it can help you break down problems. That is, a, oh, that is something I actually wish I included in my presentation. Learning how to break down problems, it looks so good in interviews. And it'll actually, it's really like coming in, not as a computer science student and learning how to break down problems has really helped me organize and like, honestly, like complete things that I wanted to complete, yeah. So would recommend recommend that discrete math as well. Thank you so much for all of that helpful advice. And like, I really did enjoy your presentation. Thank um, you. But yeah, uh, if you guys 
like um like she said earlier just message her if you still have questions um send her an email link up in linkedin we'll try to get that presentation out to you and um yeah you guys have a good rest of your day thank you for sticking around and attending and ah everything is just this was great thank you so much yeah thank you all so much appreciate your time so much yeah all right we're gonna end it cool <laughs> bye. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> bye.